What I want to talk about is um, literary history. Um, literary history? Literary history. Um, and I will skip the, the first, um, just a few aspects here. Uh, literary history has been coming into trouble about 20 years ago. There were two challenges, basically. One being from a post-structuralist point of view, saying um, all history is constructed, um, especially under the aspect of power. And um, Lyotard's concept of the, um, the re grand re narrative was has become famous and kind of put an end to many kinds of history. Um, another form of criticism um, came from Hayden White, who said, basically, history is a kind of fictional, history, historical works are a kind of fiction. Um, people are creating fictions by writing fictional uh, narratives about historical events. Um, there's been a long debate since then, but in a way, this the, these two attacks destroyed a lot of um, self-understanding things. People got irritated, um, and there have been two uh, resolutions, or some resolutions of this. Um, in the praxis of literary history, we have two experiments, one about, uh, both done by Americans actually, uh, one about uh, the French literature, another about German literature. Uh, the one about German literature is now, uh, has been published 2005. They try to get rid of all these grand narratives and they say we're just talking about little events. So you have a book with, I think, a few hundred um, little chapters and each chapter is is closely related to, a, in, to an event. This event can be the publication of the book, but very often it's an historical event. And then you have very small articles about a text, but there is nothing combining them to a history for, of whatever. And there is another approach to this um, saying, was there a problem? Um, sorry, I have, don't have to time for this kind of theoretical stuff. I have to write a history. Um, <laughs> Um, but very often this kind of approach is a bit um, undercutting the, the theoretical discussions. So my approach was to say maybe uh, we can tackle the theoretical problems but without giving up. Um, so we had a lot of discussion here on constructivisms and social constructions and um, I think this is related to this point. Um, the criticism by Hayden White, I think that's the more interesting criticism actually, um, is in, in, if you look at it closer, you see that um, he says the, um, the source of patterns, patterns can be things like we have the rise or the fall or decline or whatever, any kind of pattern. Um, in historical representations, um, has to be the historian because actually the historian has no direct access to the past. So if there is in, his histor in his, the historical representation um, a pattern and he points to the pattern, it must, he must be the historian, must be the source of it. And it implies in a way, and if you look closer at his writings, that the events and the information m m behind the events is in a way randomly distributed, so much randomly that any kind of pattern emerging from this has to be put upon this from the people who are describing what happened there. There's a two, there are twofold problems. First is, this is an ontology in itself. It says something about the reality, which is quite a strong assumption, actually. An assumption I, for example, don't share, um, that things are equally or randomly um, distributed. And another problem is he was talking about events, historical events. But actually, as literary historians, we are talking about texts. And texts are there. Um, it's nothing hidden in the past, unapproachable for me. The text is very often here on my desk, and I can point to it, read it, and share it with others. So many of the criticism, a lot of the criticism directed at literary history by people like Welbury is, in my eyes, misdirected, but it's a challenge to show whether we can base our assumption whether there are patterns in the material on new, maybe more empirical-based sources. So, 
that's the, the, the frame I was talking about. And I'm going to talk about two specific problems. The first is something like influence, how to model influence. I'm taking a specific case of influence. We have a novel by Rousseau, uh, La Nouvelle Release, and we have a novel by Goethe, Die Leiden des Jungen Werthers, and we have an expression describing this relationship. This source I'm trying, that you're reading now is um, a source, the, the, the book I'm quoting from, is, it's my bad translation, but, and um, I'm cutting a lot of things short, but basically it's one of the largest uh, his, history of German, his, uh, German literary history. So Rousseau's book was important for sensibility. That's the argument you find in the book. Um, then the description, then you have find a description of the reception of the novel and the content of the novel. And then, that's the important sentence, in this intellectual climate, die Leiden des jungen Werther originated. In this intellectual climate, they originated. Oh, that's bad, isn't it? I mean, it's so obviously so sloppy. And, um, and uh, I mean, model this, um, this is a real challenge. Um, that's what I first thought. But if you start to think about it, you say, that's interesting, actually. Um, they're talking about influence. But influence is a bad metaphor in itself, actually, because there is nothing pouring in or flowing into something. Um, the, the, the whole concept of influence is rather bad, actually, because the concept imposes the, the agent in influence is here Rousseau. But actually, Rousseau was rather um, in France at that time and not in Frankfurt writing the novel. So we have to switch things around and say, we're not talking about influence, but let's say selection. It's a proposal by a German um, sociologist. So Goethe selected this book as being important for him. Yeah, but selection, that's rather too intentional in the closer, me in the, the narrow meaning of intentional meaning, um, because he had, no, he had no say in choosing this. So, Obviously, this is a very, and I'm not going down this, I just wanted to point to this, saying this is a very complex relation. And climate, if you look at this closely, is a very, very good expression of this relationship. It is like a metaphor and showing there is something there, a complex relationship, and we could unpack it, we being the historian of literary history, but he doesn't have the time or the place to do this. So he's just pointing to this. And replacing it by something which is more clear really loses all the information um, which is explicitly not said at that moment. So modeling has the challenge here to be explicitly vague. And I find this uh, without, without, I find this as a, a specific problem because it's much more easier to say, I do know what I'm, what I'm modeling, but saying, I know that there's a complex relationship and I can't model it at the moment, just point to the right direction. That's what language is doing all the time. And we don't have, or I can't see a way to model this at the moment. And replacing it with something more specific means that I quadruple or quantify the time of, I have to spend just with this relationship to um, an amount that it will, I will never finish a literary history at all. Um, so that would be my first question. What do you do about that? Um, second question, corpus studies. Um, empirical base, the, the, the wish to base your, infirm, the, your um, assertions about literary history on something more empirical. Nowadays you go to corpus studies and you do something like this. This is an, uh, the result of an R macro. I'm very, very thankful for uh, Masei Ada and Jan Rubicki. Many of them you know, will probably seen has, have seen their presentation on the last um, DH. Um, they wrote a very nice macro which allows you to put in a group of texts and then um, say, please calculate using uh, some very easy uh, measurements, one of them based on John Barrow's Delta, um, 
use the distance of similarity between them, stylistic similarity based on the most frequent words. And the first thing you, you notice here, the, the colors at this, um, in this first few slides, the same color indicates the same author. So the first thing you notice is it's working rather perfectly. Um, it's a very, very simple measurement and it's working perfect, um, which is for a humanist who says everything is so complex, um, just counting words can't be, can't be doing it right, but it does. Um, even that you, you see the, first the one t uh, for, um, red text a little bit in distance to the others, um, that's the first novel by Fontane, and he wrote the rest 40, 40 years later, so it makes sense that there's a distance here. Um, then I started to throw um, books of a, diff a specific genre together with, with, with other books into this. Um, uh, you don't have to make any sense out of this image, but I want to switch to this. It's the same, but now you have in violet, you have um, groups which have erotic uh, the narratives as their content. And suddenly you see this tool is, at this moment, it, um, it finds genre. Not only author is the author is group, but the genre are group, or the texts belonging to one genre are grouped. Um, this is rather amazing. And you can do the same thing with gender. Um, here you have a lot of texts by different authors, and here you have them grouped um, by the same, it's the same diagram, just using different colors to express male and female authors. Um, just based on most frequent words. Okay, that's what's out there, and many of you know this kind of tool. The problem now for me is how do these different things relate to each other? What is the data model here? The data model in a more narrow sense is obviously first, bag of words, and secondly, most frequent words. So the text is conceptualized as a bag of words, and then um, you have, as an indicator of uh, stylistic similarity, you use most frequent words. And this is related to a conception of a concept like gender or the or erotic novel. And now, when this comes back to the discussion we had all the time here, what are we talking about here? What is gender? A data model or what because when we as we very often in, um, were tended to at this in this discussion when we tend to say every kind of conceptualization is a model we have at least three models here uh, somehow interrelated um, so maybe it's more fruitful but that's just a proposal and I would like to discuss with the, you um, say no we are re referring to data model to things like bag of words and most frequent words, and maybe even just to bag of words, and say most frequent words is, is not a data model at that moment, because that's in the algorithm, basically. And the other things are models, intellectual models. Um, and then we have a clear distinction, and I have learned in the cooperation with Julia that's very German, to have this preference for very clear distinctions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That were the, these are the two questions I wanted to pose to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Historical data today, and you see the distributions are also not random. Right? It's, like it's, it's, it's 
it's not rendered and discussed now in Mother Midnight, for example. And um, the other thing is this kind of uh, the question of the model emerging from the data, right? So there is a lot of modeling in the background of what, what is done there, right? Because most free converts does refer to something that is probably the most free convert in the books um, as related to all the words in a corpus, which is uh, computer scientists call it TFI, right? Term frequency inverse document. And there's a lot of model modeling you can do, right? Because you have some concept about the corpus. So without that, you cannot really stop. The other thing is with influence. There has been a huge discussion in art history, for example, about the direction of influence, right? There's this uh, excursus against influence by uh, Michael Black Sambo of 1985, who points out there's way more verbs which describe the, the selection direction, right? And not the influence direction. But you're right, it could go both ways, right? But a lot of, a lot of uh, data, data disciplines have actually learned that it, it makes much more sense to talk in the Latin selection way, right? So if you think about cytometrics, people stop thinking about bibliometric coupling, but now they talk about co-citation, because what you have in terms of art history is called the T.S. Eliot effect. Once Rodin is around and does unfinished sculptures, our notion of Michelangelo changes forever. So co-citation or uh, selection makes the past a dynamic kind of object. But if you look at influence, you say, OK, it's the static past, and it, it only changes the future. And, and that's, that's somehow not really honest, right? Because every one of us has a different concept of the past. So the, the past is really that. And I think that's the things we have to take into account. And then if you do the bridge for this last thing of, the, of, of these consensus trees, that's very similar to another uh, domain where we have similarity and dependence, which is biology, where you have, they all, they, they just, they construct these trees and they point out in textbooks, right? You cannot really find the root. You don't know where it, where's the origin of the shard, for example. It's probably not at the node where Fontana and somebody else goes. It could be somewhere else in this tree, right? So there is no top of hierarchy. Which is inconvenient for you. said, zero, point of zero in the, the these are, um, this is based on algorithms um, invented or developed by people in the in bioinformatics. And, mm -hmm. and there's one point in, to my, um, layman's understanding where, where um, you can say everything is which is distant from starting from this point is has the same distance from each other. Mm -hmm. So um, but then as soon as you're in one of the branches um, things you can measure that distance to each other and say, okay I understand this is uh, this book is nearer to the other. But um, um, I'm not sure that I understand understood your comment about the model. What I wanted to want to, to point out is that model would be the generic term, mm -hmm. which also covers data modeling, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, and, and data modeling would be a very specific activity then, um, so that we allow for things which are not really, which are vague, for example, as I point out, they're vague, but they already, they have some, they use some kind of classification, some kind of um, understanding and putting into concept, but they express it differently and it's not, um, it doesn't have the, the same requirements as more data modeling. Um, so with respect to the problem of how do we make progress on modeling when we know we can't get it exactly right, but it's, now it's time to move on. Um, so uh, the, from an example, uh, using example from my, from my presentation, um, I, I said that it seemed that, that uh, according to our analysis, Berber um, entities should really be roles. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're doing that on um, sort of general principles, you're really, uh, it, it seems like, well, I, we seem that like we were kind of anticipating or accommodating the possibility that, say, the text of what we did might have realized some other work, say, a uh, special theory of relativity. Um, now, that's nothing. How much time should one spend accommodating that um, you know, possibility? After all, it exists only in another possible, or maybe it's just a future or other possible world, but no library institution. So it did seem to us that um, 
there was a class of, um, of modeling improvements that were probably not worth pursuing in actual situations, just like to normalize relational databases are often much more effective for querying or speed or something mm -hmm. like that. So we conceded that the normalized ontologies, um, which would be ones that weren't quite right, uh, could often be better and ought to be preferred to ones that were exactly right. Mm -hmm. So one way to pursue it is if I say we're not going to pursue this puzzle, we're not going to figure out exactly Right. We have we have something that works. We're confident it will work. Now that particular case is one where you're not saying anything false. There are other cases where it seems like if you don't solve the problem, you might be saying something false. Ship of Theseus, you just reconcile yourself with the fact that um, in principle, you know, there is a removal of a part that makes a different ship and a small part that doesn't. And, 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 as, and also assume that you won't be iterating transitivity of identity a thousand times in your, on your ships, vis-a-vis your, -vis your ships or your, or your texts. Yeah. And cross your fingers and move on. It's, it's not the shuttle. Or, um, Maybe I must do this quick. Misunderstood, but would it mean that you have to at least you have one? position how this relationship is modeled, um, for example, between the two books and say, um, I, can say I can say at least this about them. And then finding that people in the humanities tend to use very often metaphors or other um, vague descriptions, which are deliberately vague, because they, they that's the most effective way, actually, of conveying so much but not more information. I would distinguish metaphor, the issue of metaphorical <coughs> and idiomatic usage from, from vagueness. So I think vagueness is a, a very uh, precisely identified issue. Very, it's very important to have vague terms in ordinary communication. And it's hard to accommodate them in modeling. Um, but a vagueness is probably, uh, allowing yourself vagueness um, will probably not have the same kinds of uh, Give you the same influence this results, that would give you most of the good results, um, as, uh, as trying to uh, represent metaphorical usage um, in, in no, data description languages um, that represent the metaphor as if it were literal. There, I think you'll have objects that don't exist in your ontology. Yeah, if you take them literally, I right. totally agree. You have to translate the. the what the expression refers to, you have to uh, translate right. it in a way. But then the, the question is, how precise can this translation be and without losing the intention of to be vague? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the question is. Um, exactly, precisely. For example, in this case, I analyze um, is a way to refer to something by keeping it vague. The relationship it denotes is deliberately vague, and so you just put it away. Actually, exactly that what I would would like to include into my description of what these kind of sentences do in the humanities. And if you wanted to point out that they are much better in a way than we usually think. Um, because um, they obviously um, they are not working as, um, as clear cut uh, references as we um, think they should. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll just say that you know, vagueness is um, something which you know, no one has ever managed to free from paradox and puzzle. It's essential to communication, obviously, and if you have a modeling project that depends upon eliminating 
<laughs> right, but I, I think everything Fotos says actually speaks to that. I think yeah. that they're, they're, we're actually looking at something really tremendously important here because what, what, um, what I think this relates to is actually our conversations about, uh, about pre-formal versus formal descriptions of our objects or you know, the improvisational stages, the raw stages versus the more refined, more formalized and the more specified stages later on and how you don't ever, in a sense, want to end the previous stage even while you move into the next stage because you've got that, that you know, the paradoxes and the, 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 the relationship between those stages. Because when, when, when you as a scholar step back and you say, I'm going to describe this as a climate, right? I mean, the, the beauty of a metaphor is it says one thing very, very specifically, very precisely, and then implies many other things, and it leaves another set of things completely unstated and in the air, right? So it's not that the, that the metaphor is vague, it's that a metaphor is a way of saying something and not even addressing other things, right? And by by virtue of applying a different, you know, a different language, a different perspective on the problem, right? And so this this isn't to say that we're saying something vague. It's to say that we're saying something, but we're deliberately foregoing the opportunity to spend ten years in the question of exactly what we mean by X, Y, Z, right? And, and it means what this. Depends on what they mean when they say something. We don't say something vague. Um, the expression "climate" isn't vague. But, uh, That's right. Uh, the all the possible exactly. things you can do based on this uh, expression. Right. They. That's a very. And it, it's something that's what's important with them. Maybe implying that this one could be in this one. That's right. And and that because that's sense. unspecified, it's left between the author and the reader to sort of agree implicitly on the uh, appropriateness of the metaphor without any explicit or, or spelled out understanding of it, what, what those implications are can be taken to mean, right? And so in a sense what it, 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 it's it's really a res it's a it's a determination of the resolution of the image that you're going to apply. You know? It's like I'm gonna go all the way down here and pick you know, pixelate this, you know, intricately, and yet this other thing, I'm going to step back and say, I can see the shape of this without ever trying to get down into the details and leave it to my reader to come along with me on this, right? So, you know, it, it, it relates both to this question about what we choose not to formalize or what we decide we can't formalize, and to this question of how we relate to our audience and the nature of the performance, right? In other words, that there's a, a process that a scholar undergoes which involves selection not only of, 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 of what to study, but how to approach it, and where to emphasize, and where to, you know, clarify. Yeah. Did you say that against the Lego metaphor? <laughs> I would leave you to do the Lego metaphor. <laughs> I think the terms like gender and influence and authorship and are, are not, and this is maybe to, just to restate what Wendell said, they're, they're not vaguely defined or ill-defined. They're, they're deliberately undefined. They're, they're deliberately put forth with with, with ever tentative definitions. And the reason for that is because that is the contested site of the discourse. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to solve for X where X is gender, mm -hmm. you are, as far as I'm concerned, concerned with the project of trying to destroy <coughs> literary studies as a topic. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not being, I'm not joking. I mean, the, these things are not, I mean, what's mystifying us? The only thing I see in terms of a data model in, in this is, is a bunch of key value pairs that tie words to frequency. That's the only data model that's in here. Everything else is a function or a process or some, you know, something else. And at the end of that thing is something, you know, these words like gender and influence. And, and this is absolutely mystifying to me. I mean, I don't know how we start with word counts and end with, and end with gender. But it may be that we're, we're hoping that, that somehow we feel like there should be some relationship. Like, given what we started with, there should be some clarity at the end of the process. But I wonder if that's what, it doesn't seem to be that we're looking for clarity on questions of things like gender and influence. In, in other words, when you say influence is a bad metaphor, it seems to me that you have made an absolutely trenchant and marvelous literary critical observation. And you don't want to destroy that <laughs> with your algorithms, or you don't want to, or if your algorithm should sight on, light on that, uh, more power to you. But that doesn't mean that we're going to sort of end up with defined terms for things like gender 
You addressed this to him or to me? Uh, to you, I guess. Uh, yeah, but, uh, just, to, just to the, just to the, the spirit of the conversation. I get frustrated in text analytical discussions because people say, that can't possibly define gender. And, and all I can think is, none of you can define gender. None of you. I mean, all we do is fit the problem because that's what, that, is what, that is what our discourse is about. I'm a bit less pessimistic about definitions uh, or explications, which is much more useful in this context, but um, it doesn't matter here because I wouldn't say this. We are talking about that the numbers and the relationship to each other is a definition or explication of gender, but obviously the concept of gender is in close relation to what the numbers show us, and that's the main point here. So that we have a model of the world talking, uh, dividing population in two or more groups and, and numbers which for some reasons we don't understand yet do the same um, with, with text and I think that's interesting. Um, yeah, no, no, me too. The subject to which I've devoted my life. Yeah. But, but it doesn't mean it's the anxiety that bothers me. You know, the, the same, right? no, I'm, not, I'm not accusing you of it. I'm just saying no, no, no. That, I think I'm accusing the critics of text analysis. Oh, so okay. yeah. um, I'm with you. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> First is general, um, if we talk about labels and ambiguity, I think natural language is, is best suited for those. Why is there anything else but natural language um, for expressing them? Um, as to gender and genre, um, they would be first class citizens in any RDFS um, based like right ontology. So um, they may not be part of the data model, um, but they would be perfect part of the Positional model like RDF, um, which is somewhere between a data model in the strict sense and, and language. I had a nice conversation yesterday with Alan about how RDF would relate to natural language. Um, I think this is the moment where we can take this up again. A response? Or? No, no, I think it was more of Okay. I would, I, would, I would disagree on the fact that some of the key value pairs we're talking about. I think there is a beta model. In the beta model, there's two keys. One is the text and the other one is the words. And then there is, for every one of these two keys, there is a, a key value pair. You have the frequency of words in the book, and you have the frequency of books for a word, which is a network. And basically, all the models we are talking about um, are consistent of this kind of basic construction of bipartite networks. If you're lucky, there is only one thing, which is a cell phone. And this thing is the thing you do measurements on which is very, very interesting. So the TF-IDF model, if you count words and compare it to the average um, um, frequency of the word in the total code, that's what, what's equivalent to the climate, right? Is that that's the mean field model, that there is some, 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 some universal distribution of the word is and that and I and A and stuff like that, right? So the point is, this kind of, this kind of uh, uh, analysis has actually a more complete notion of data model than most of our models have. I, don't, I just don't, I can't like the three that TF idea has yeah. No, no, it doesn't, it's not, it's not a map data model, but conceptually it presupposes that you have this pair of things. Yeah, and, and then you have this, there's this true relation between word and text. And then in the background, and that's the thing we usually don't do, there is this mean field, right? Which, which they say, okay, it's the frequency of the corpus because they don't have all the books in the world, right? And I think if you, if, you, if you consider that, it's a very interesting thing to talk about the vagueness of climate because, in fact, here, the climate is based on one instance, which is Rousseau. And Rousseau, the atoms of Rousseau-ness are not distributed in a mean or average way. So that means that basically this post-structuralist notion of climate as something based on a few instances Actually, not. I I okay. I
Okay. Okay. Um, like very many people, I'm not. I'm not going to be exactly doing what I said I was going to do. <laughs> uh, not very surprising. Um, Okay, but anyhow, I'll start. So I stand here as a linguist. I don't stand here as a computational linguist or a computer sci scientist or what have you. I stand here as a linguist. Yeah? So, so my main interest is, is um, let's say, linguistic description of um, yeah, objects I'm interested in. Okay? Right, so anyhow. Now, being here at uh, Brown University is a great honor for various reasons. I mean, it's a great honor to be uh, here with you together and have these discussions. But for me as a linguist and also a computational linguist, um, it's a particular honor because uh, some great people uh, work here or did work here who have been very influential in the field um, of linguistics uh, in general and in particular in computational linguistics and corpus linguistics. And uh, one of these people was mentioned by Sid uh, yesterday. Uh, that was Eugene Char Charniak, and I would say um, Eugene Charniak was probably the, in probably the initiator of uh, statistical natural language processing. Now, uh, we have had this approach to natural language uh, processing maybe in the last 15, 20 years or so, and before that everything was rule-based and symbolically oriented and stuff like that. And when it all happened, it came as a great shock to everybody. Um, maybe a similar shock, uh, like foot is shock. Okay, how can it be that when I count the words, yeah, uh, I come up with the same classifications of a text uh, I've been thinking about for years and things like that, yeah? Okay, but anyhow, so, so that's computational linguistics. Uh, so these, these models, I, they're not data models. I don't know what to call things anymore, anyhow, after three days. But, okay, um, um, they've been very influential. And me, as a linguist, um, the shocked I was when I first learned that you can do everything with statistics, um, have become um, a very helpful tool. And I'm going to show uh, you some of, yeah, some of this in this talk. Okay, so, so that's... Um, that's that, that's computational linguistics. But then there's another person uh, who worked at uh, Brown University who actually owns a number of patents I found yesterday on the net. And this is Henry Kutcherer. And um, Henry Kutcherer uh, has also been very influential in the field of computational linguistics but also uh, uh, corpus linguistics because Henry Kutcherer and um, <coughs> his colleague um, um, Nelson Francis, they uh, compiled the so-called Brown Corpus. Now, this is a corpus that was compiled here at Brown University in the late 1960s, and uh, a corpus, a small corpus to, to today's standards, just one million tokens, but um, it was supposed to reflect uh, at the time, or to give a snippet of, um, of uh, contemporary American English at, at the time, um, collecting texts or text extracts from a thousand samples of text uh, and covering um, yeah, 15 different registers or, or text types if you want. Hmm? Now this, this resource was also quite, in, quite mm, not, not influential but perhaps very useful. It was very useful to have this resource for computational linguistics. A lot of computational linguistic tools and programs have just grabbed this corpus and trained their programs yeah, um, on this corpus. Um, but it was also, <clears throat> at the same time, important in corpus linguistics because it was kind of the first resource of its, of its kind uh, representing something like, um, okay, uh, contemporary American English. Yeah? Um, so also linguists, corpus linguists, they used this corpus and they extended this corpus there's also a British uh, English version of this corpus, the lob corpus, and then there are later versions, um, like later, diachronically later um, uh, versions um, of texts from the 1990s. So, 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 so this, this became kind of the base for a, for a diachronic corpus uh, of British and American English. Okay. So, um,
having said that, I think, so there are many threads in my talk, but there, there will be two threads, at least, and maybe a third one. Uh, but I don't know whether I can take it to the end. Uh, so that's the role of computational linguistic products uh, in, in our work, yeah? um, such as parsers and taggers and things like that. Um, and um, yeah, the, the, practice of, the practice of doing something, approaching a linguistic question with corpus linguistic methods. Okay, so, but before I start showing um, this work I'm, I'm doing currently, currently in my group, let me try to pull things together again a little bit. So, I'm a linguist, I said. So, um, in a, as a linguist, I'm a bit different from other philologists, I guess. I'm, I'm different from Fortis as a, as a literary studies person. I'm, I'm not a historian, and so on and so on. Uh, but what is it that we're actually all... Uh, that we're all interested in. So at first sight, okay, it seems there, there are many differences. And one difference is probably that um, as a literary studies person, like, like Fortis, uh, I'm interested in, 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 a, in, in, a textual, in textual artifacts that have some particular social cultural value that are valued very much in a, in a, in a culture. Yeah? Like, for example, this poem. Hmm? Um, and when I'm in the arts or in art history, then it's the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this unique object, and I want to say something about this unique object. Um, as a linguist, uh, it's different. I don't care. Yeah? I take any object that is text. Um, I don't talk about pictures. But for a linguist, it looks a bit, it looks a bit more mundane, and we come back to the, back to the food metaphor. Um, so, as a linguist, I'm interested in things like this, yeah? So, maybe you can't see properly, but there are letters in this soup, yeah? It's a letter, letter and carrot soup. Um, so, when I first look at the text, yeah, I don't care, yeah? It's not exactly true, but, okay, I don't, I don't care so much. It's a text, and... Maybe I've, I have some hypothesis about the text, but maybe I don't. So first of all, I just consider it like an, like as an unordered unit of things. Um, and my first um, urge, the first thing I want to do, yeah, is I want to put some order. I want to create some order. And uh, so if I apply it to the soup, I want to do something like this. Yeah? Actually, this also happens to me with the carpet, and I keep staring at this carpet, and I find, try to find some pattern. Okay, yeah, so, so this is the first urge. It's not the ultimate thing I want to do, but this is something I feel I need to do. Okay, so, <clears throat> now, try, let, let me try to pull this together again. Uh, I think what still unites us, no matter, yeah, literary studies and historians, um, is that we're, we're interested in this art, this semiotic artifact. Mm -hmm. So it's not a natural, it's not a physical, a physics phenomenon or anything like that. It's a, it's a semiotic artifact. It's created by humans. Um, and all of us were interested somehow in these three aspects of a semiotic artifact. And we're interested in the relations between these three aspects of a semiotic artifact. Now, the difference is that I think um, when you are a literary studies person or art, arts person or art historian, or maybe even yeah, a library science person, you're, you're more interested in, in this part uh, of the triangle. Yeah, you're interested in the thought, in, in, in the concept, maybe in the social, it could, the thought could also be the social, it's not necessarily the cognitive, yeah? it could also be the social. And, and something in the world, yeah, which is perhaps the referent of that. Uh, now, when you're a linguist, I think you're more on this, on this side. You're very much interested in the, in the, in the symbol, in the sense of signifiant. Uh, so you like playing around with that. So when you see these letters on the floor, you want to do something to them. Um, and then you're very cautious in, in actually 
um, making this link uh, to the thought. Yeah? But you would never start with a thought, yeah? or rarely, at least not if you're that type of linguist I am. Yeah? Okay, there might be others, there will be others. Yeah? So, so maybe yeah, we can think about this a, a little bit. <clears throat> so, yeah, but maybe one more sentence about this. So when I come back to Fotis' dilemma, yeah, so, so your dilemma is really um, when you find something at the level of the symbol, like you have counted the words or something that, some unit that may seem quite arbitrary to you, um, then how do you, how do you relate, relate this to the thought, to the level of the thought in this, in this model? Yeah. Okay, but I see the dilemma. I, I'm, I also have it. <laughs> Okay, so the question then is, um, for a linguist, how do I get from the unordered soup to the ordered soup or, and beyond it? And this is what I'm going to be talking about. <clears throat> okay, um, now, um, the, so I would start from something like this or a collection of this, um, and then, and it's just a common practice now in, in corpus linguistics, I would apply some tools to automatic, automatically or also to manually um, annotate um, these, these texts. Uh, maybe I would even already call that a corpus. So I annotate them and then um, I get another version of the corpus which has been annotated, which has been enriched with information. And perhaps I also have various formats, this corpus in various formats. I'm going to speak about formats as well in a second. Uh, okay, so far so good. Um, so, so this part, it's quite well understood and nobody questions that this is how, how you do it. Yeah? But then how do you proceed? Mm, well, you got the corpus there, it's, it has been enriched with other types of information, but then what do you do? Because what you want to do is an analysis. Yeah? The annotation is not the analysis, you just take it for granted, you don't care about it, you rely on the part of speech taggers, syntactic parsers, lemmatizers, tokenizers, and so on, yeah? which, which have their own models. Uh, but then, <clears throat> what do you do? Yeah, so you have to find, uh, in this annotated resource, you have to find some interesting or relevant features, rele features that are relevant for what you actually look at or look for, your analysis goal. Uh, you have to find these features, you have to extract instances of these features. Then you get a set of instances. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> and once you have the set of instances, you want to inspect these instances further, and you also want, you want to evaluate them with respect to an initial question you have had. Okay, so this is a basic process, but this part of the process is much harder. Uh, it's much harder to model, and it's, yeah, just much harder um, to, to instantiate. Okay, so I make this more concrete with some examples now. <clears throat> Okay, what I'm interested or have been interested in for the last few years is um, linguistic variation, in, not in the sense of dialect variation or social variation, strictly speaking, but what we call register variation. So that is variation in the language according to the use uh, the language is put. Mm -hmm. um, now, this could be, let's say, uh, I don't know, scientific language is a certain set of registers uh, uh, in, this, in this terminology, or uh, conversation is a, some kind of a register and so on. Hmm? Now, uh, register theory, or what we observe in language, what makes a register really at the symbol level, at the level of the code, is that a register is characterized by a cluster of associated features which are typically lexicogrammatical features, which have a greater than random um, um, tendency to co-occur. Yeah? So, so this is how, how we uh, observe a register. Mm -hmm. Now, registers are typically um, relatively stable uh, in time. You, know, you, you can observe that registers diachronically, they're relatively stable, but when you look at the repertoire of registers in a language, it will, they will change, yeah? because the situations in which we use the language will change as well. Yeah? So that's just as a background. Now, the, the concrete project um, um, we are conducting 
um, at my, in my, with my group is um, we're interested in how these registers emerge, or how do they come about, what's, what's happening when new registers, new ways of saying uh, uh, come about, and we, we investigate the context in which uh, mm, new scientific fields or academic fields, disciplines um, emerge through the contact of some existing disciplines. And we look, we think of the, this as a, as a contact situation where, I don't know, for example, computer science and biology come into contact and a new discipline is formed which we call bioinformatics or you have computer science and linguistics and uh, you have computational linguistics, yeah? So, so we call this, these contact disciplines. So uh, we are interested in what are the linguistic properties of these contact disciplines, yeah? So when you take bioinformatics, is it linguistically, pu purely linguistically speaking, is it more like computer science, is it more like, bi uh, like biology, or is it something completely different? Hmm? And um, so what we need to do is we, we have to compare uh, the linguistic, yeah, the, the linguistic, the, the discourses that uh, are produced uh, by these disciplines. So what we're after is the similarities and differences between them, yeah? and uh, also asking um, whether these new emerging, emerging dis disciplines create their own language. We have to be able to say whether they create something that you can call distinctive, distinctive of the others. Hmm? Okay, so, so that's the concrete context. Now, if you have this question, so, and here I come again to corpus linguistics, what is the kind of resource you need uh, to be able to investigate this question? Now, of course, you have to build a corpus. Yeah, you have to build a corpus that consists of, of um, scientific text. Now, what we have done, we built a corpus um, of um, just English journal articles, so we don't consider any other uh, text types, as it were, just journal articles, no project reports, no patents, no whatever, yeah, just journal articles. We cover nine, <coughs> nine disciplines, um, which you can see here, um, and we have two time slices in the corpus, so we have uh, the, the early 2000s and we have the 1970s and 80s, uh, because this is about the, the time that some of these uh, disciplines have emerged. So eventually we want to investigate how, how linguistically uh, these these registers have uh, evolved. Yeah? So, and what we typically do then, we're interested in the relationship between, within uh, triples, triples in this corpus. So, for instance, the relationship between computational linguistics, linguistics and computer science, or the relationship between bioinformatics, uh, computer science and biology, linguistically speaking. Yeah? Okay. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about the diachronic aspect of this, so I'm just talking about the discipline aspect of this. Okay. Now, in terms of encoding, um, well, the sources we got the corpus from were, were PDF files, and then you can imagine what we had to do uh, to the PDF files to get something out of them to, uh, that was processable in some, uh, in some sense. Now, we have different, uh, f different versions of the corpus in terms of different formats. Um, plain text, HTML and XML version, and one, one version that is encoded in the format of the corpus query processor, and I come back to this. Now, the types of information we encode for the corpus is bibliographical data, as you can see here, the discipline, also the logical structure of the documents, uh, and then in terms of the linguistics, linguistic units, sentences, tokens, and so on, and then some linguistic categories that can be annotated automatically. Now, uh, one of the formats that is very useful to us um, is uh, this is a very simple format, uh, as you can see here. Uh, that's the format used by this uh, corpus query processor, which was developed at the University of Stuttgart. So we just we basically just have a tab separated uh, format where we encode uh, the the token, the lemma, or the values for the token, the lemma, and the part of speech. And we can add others, yeah, we could add others. So it's a simple, it's a very simple format. Okay, now which analysis methods are needed to work on this, work, work, work on this resource? Mm -hmm. Well, 
like I said, what we have to do is the whole thing is an exercise of comparison and detecting between the different subcorpora, detecting similarities and differences. So in that sense, it's very similar to what Fotis showed us before on his data. Yeah? Um, so what we compare, what we want to compare things according to is register on the one hand and then eventually also time, so the diachronic aspect. What we compare things in terms of is lexicogrammatical features. And I show you examples of this in a minute. Yeah? And we want to compare lexicogrammatical features or distributions of lexicogrammatical features in some context, the register or the time. Now here I'm only showing the register. So uh, what we work with in doing these comparisons, we, we, um, we, we, we calculate uh, the relative similarity or difference yeah, in terms of uh, comparing like probability distributions of uh, feature probabilities across these corpora. And that's always the same thing you do here. Yeah? OK, now let me go to some examples. <coughs> so. Um, so how do you, so one of the big questions is how do you get interesting and relevant features that will bring out differences between these subcorpora if they exist? Because this is what we're interested in. Hmm? Now, the, the, the selection of features is, is inspired by, essentially inspired by linguistic theory or linguistic description, yeah? Uh, things other people have said before that could be interested could be interesting, huh? could be distinctive uh, features uh, that are worth looking at. Now, one area that you would expect um, there could be interesting differences. Yeah? When you look at these disciplines, huh? they're very different disciplines, bioinformatics and mechanical engineering, or linguistics and uh, electrical engineering, yeah? is actually uh, what, are the stance, what are the stances and the evaluations that are expressed in these texts? Huh? Because it's not like scientific text does not express stance or evaluation. No, on the contrary. Yeah? OK, so um, now this is a big question. Mm? It's very, an, a very abstract question. So how, do we, how, do we, how can we tease it out from the material? Yeah? So eventually, I need to find some lexical, grammatical, or lexical grammatical feature that expresses yeah, stance and evaluation or particular um, values for stance uh, and uh, evaluation. Now, one uh, pattern that um, uh, colleagues of ours uh, have investigated, that's basically Susan Hunston in, in Birmingham, um, they found that there is a particular pattern, it's quite interesting, it is the pattern, it is adjective to, or it is adjective that. Now, when you look at this pattern, it's very interesting. When you just look at the grammatical pattern, you will hardly find any expression that is not evaluative. So, so it, it's like this grammatical pattern, it attracts very much evaluative adjectives. Well, that's quite interesting, yeah? Okay, so you've seen the examples. You had time to look at these examples, and you can uh, think about them. So, so then there's two ways. Uh, lexicogrammatically speaking, that you can express this sort of evaluation. So an, an epistemic stance towards something like in obviously or it's obvious that, or um, an attitudinal stance as in it's interesting that or interestingly, uh, and that is used to use a modal ad adverb or to use this pattern. Hmm? Okay, so then the question is, are there differences across these registers we have here? or not. Mm? So hopefully there are some interesting differences. Mm? So we, what we need to do, we need to extract instances of these patterns. Yeah? Uh, we calculate the distribution of these patterns. And then what we could do, we could just you know, do a statistical test on whether yeah, this, is, um, this is actually uh, not, a, not a random uh, kind of distribution that we see, but that it actually um, uh, means something. Okay. So just a quick uh, technical thing. So extraction is done of the, these patterns is done by regular expressions. So the CQP, the corpus query processor, query language is just a, just a regular expression uh, kind of query language. And I can tell you, linguists need, want, love 
regular expressions. So don't give a linguist any query tool that doesn't do regular expressions. We need them. Hmm? We won't be happy without them. Okay, so now this is what you get back. And then, of course, what you, you count these things. You don't have to read this. This is a table uh, which gives you the numbers um, for the occurrences <coughs> across corpora and across types of, types of expressions. And then that table, of course, you, you can then calculate, say, a statistical test using the table. Now, to make it more human readable, uh, the relative uh, frequencies of these yeah. So what you have here in the orange yellow shades is it's these modal adverbs and the blue shades is the pattern. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I'll just pick out one uh, thing for you. So what you can see here, for example, bio, that's biology. Yeah. It uses, um, it uses a lot uh, the adverbial, the, the adverb. And among uh, the, the different uh, types of adverb types of meaning that are expressed, it uses very much, interestingly. Now, this is relative, yeah? This is uh, relative to the others. It doesn't say it actually occurs, absolutely speaking, very often, but uh, uh, relatively speaking, um, it uses those quite a lot. Now, when you compare this to, um, to this, to this, to this newer discipline that has kind of kind of emerged from from biology in cooperation with computer science, uh, if you want, yeah, then you can see a different uh, pattern here. Yeah, and when you test when you test these things statistically, then you can see that it's um, um, it's significant. Yeah? So you can explore this further. Yeah, that's uh, actually quite interesting. <clears throat> okay, now. Let me give one more example, and then I probably need to <laughs> rush. Um, so it's the same idea again. Yeah? It's, it's using slightly uh, uh, different methods in the end, but it's the same idea. Now, uh, also, what we could be interested in looking at these different, uh, at these discourses that these dis disciplines um, create um, we could also be interested in how the, the, the actors in these communities and the authors of these papers, but more generally speaking, the actors in these communities, how they construe themselves. What do, th what do they think they do? Right? And um, so one indicator you could use here, it's just one, yeah? you could check for the pattern we, what we do. Yeah? What do we do? We plus a verb, any verb. Yeah? Okay. So it's the same thing, so you extract instances of the pattern, you look at the distribution, or you make other calculations on the distribution, frequency distributions, and in this case, what we used was text classification, automatic text classification using a support vector machine. Okay, so what you get from this are two things. Yeah? So you get, when you, when you apply this classifier, um, you, you can, you can, you can, see the verbs, the, the, the instances of verbs that are used, and they're used with a particular frequency, of course, and then you can also rank these. Now, when we compare computer science, computational linguistics, and linguistics, uh, you can see here, yeah, so computer science tends to act very formally. Uh, we prove, we show, we obtain, and so on. Computational linguistics, these days, that's, that's 2000s, it acts very experimentally, if you want, um, examine, implement, use, and linguistics uh, is a bit of a mixture of things, yeah, so linguists tend to propose, suggest, argue a lot, I guess, and they can also feel and see. So uh, this is not, you know, and it's, this is really distinctive. Yeah. Okay, another thing um, that is uh, interesting um, as a, as a <laughs> it's, it's another product of the, of the classification you can look at and the product you can look at, which comes about by the automatic classification, is what we call the confusion matrix. So when you apply a classifier, it, you, get, you, you never really get 100% accuracy. So, so the, classifier, the automatic classifier takes yeah, these feature distributions and the individual text, and it makes a prediction about, given these features, yeah, which class does a particular text belong to. Hmm? Now, this is never 100% correct. Now, you can look at the confusion matrix and, and see what the error is that happens and where the error happens. 
So when you look at this, so again, this is co comparing computer science, computational linguistics and linguistics, yeah? Where do most of the misclassifications occur? Now, most of the misclassifications occur actually for computational linguistics. So that thing, that discipline that is kind of somehow, perhaps, in between uh, computer science and linguistics. So most of these misclassifications occur for uh, computational linguistics and only very few these are the green numbers, occur between computer science and linguistics. Yeah? So does that then mean yeah, that computational linguistics is actually in between the two? And also the other thing you can see that computational linguistics is very often misclassified as linguistics. Yeah? More often than it is misclassified as computer science. And linguistics is more often misclassified, misclassified as computational linguistics than computer science is misclassified classified as computational linguistics. Yeah? So does that mean that computational linguistics is still, it's in between, but it's still closer to linguistics? I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah? This is, we have to explore this further. But this is, this is a kind of a, a, a product uh, that is created uh, from the classification that you could then still explore to, to find an answer to your question. OK, I think I'll stop here with the examples. I have more examples which are interesting. Um, I said that we also have marked up the document structure, you, so you could also bring the document structure into, um, yeah, as a, as a factor if you want. Are these things differently distributed according to um, the, the sections of the document and so on? But let me uh, try to wrap this up. So, um, so this is that picture, yeah? So, so as a linguist you have a soup and you want to bring some order into the soup and maybe more, yeah? Um, and you have particular processing pipelines to do this, but you have to build them. Yeah? That's part of, part of the process. Um, now, uh, what's the modeling that is involved here? Now, there is a lot of computational modeling, of course, but that's not a modeling we do, yeah? So we as linguists, we use things that were modeled by computer scientists or computational linguists. And um, in, in these models, I mean, these models are influenced by a lot of things, by probability theory, information theory, linguistic theory, formal grammar, and so on. Um, and maybe we don't have to know so much about them, but we should know a little bit about them. We should know at least that we can rely on them. We should know, uh, we should be able to trust them in the sense that we should know how to make sure that we find the best part of speech tagger for our purposes or the best syntactic parser for our purposes and, and so on. Yeah? So that is also something, some knowledge that I think a digital, digital humanist who's doing work like we are doing should know. Um, okay. Um, a formal grammar comes into play, you know, like regular expressions, um, context-free grammars, um, they, they come in, for example, at the language, at the, at the end of the query language, so we should also know a little bit about this, yeah? what, what can they do for us? And then at the end of the analysis, in the very end, I mean, there's statistics there, there's probability theory. Um, tja, I'm sorry, we also have to know something about that, I, I assume, and we have to learn. Okay, now in terms of tools, yeah, this, this the, the, the pipeline is, of course, uh, plugging tools together. So various tools have been plugged together here. Um, and I guess the creative process in this is um, not so much... Well, it's, it's also a technical challenge. You have to plug these tools together. But it's also to think about these workflows that you create and which tools can create the right uh, workflows for you. Okay, now, requirements on data modeling for linguistics. I th Maybe it's not data modeling, but I'm, now I don't know. So I'll just, I just left it there. Um, okay, data modeling comes into play in a narrower sense, of course, when you, cons when you make the corpus. Yeah, so you have to encode the corpus, you have to compile it, you have to think about the formats, and you have to think about the types of information that you include in the corpus. Uh, one, one thing that is important here is that I think to make the corpus addressable, you do have to identify 
the relevant objects of your study. And we talked about what are the objects of our study and how do we perhaps also decompose a particular object of study, what are the units that we're looking at. And I think we do need some agreement on what the, these units are we're looking at. Hmm? Okay, um, then there's computational processing. Well, um, there's a lot of task-specific models that are in this, in this workflow, yeah? um, rather than one overarching model. So I, I, I wouldn't know at this moment how I would construe an overarching model for, for all of this. I don't know, but there's different, various models in it. And each of these models, uh, at least for the computational processing, they can be tested for adequacy. And that, that's another aspect of a model, I think. A model has to be testable. Okay, um, corpus analysis tools. Um, back in the 1990s, corpus linguists still thought that they could build the ideal corpus tools. And there were a number of projects in Europe uh, that tried to do this, like the MATE or the NIGHT project, um, to those of you who have heard about these projects. So um, at the beginning of the 2000s, then there was this awareness developed that it's probably not possible to build this ideal tool. So instead, we have task-specific tools, and then we build pipelines, yeah, like this. Uh, for that, of course, we have to make sure that the tools are compatible, compatible in some way. Yeah? That's the trade-off, if you want. And uh, nowadays, and, yeah, in corpus linguistics, or in people in corpus linguistics who are concerned with building tools, this is what they do. Yeah? They, they think about the processing pipelines and how they uh, make, um, try to make tools compatible in the sense of some interchange language or pivot language that we can use between the tools and so on. Now, I actually like this because this recognizes, um, this also gives recognition to the diversity of, um, diversity of approaches or, or tools that you can, can apply to one object. Yeah? You may have a favorite part of speech tagger, um, and if they're all um, Pl pluggable, yeah, you, you can do it. If you have just one monolithic tool, you have no choice. So I actually favor this. Okay, let's go back here. Now, anyhow, so whatever the object is you have, I think uh, it might be a soup or it might be a poem or a picture. Um, I do think that you have, one has to think seriously about, um, um, yeah, the smaller bits and pieces that, that it consists of and that, you, that we can agree to some extent what these are because only if we agree we can also share the properties that we want to assign to them. Mm -hmm. And I finish with a quote from, uh, from the webpage describing, uh, de describing Eugene Charniak who says, and, and you can try to translate this to, to, to humanities. Mm -hmm. Eugene Charniak is interested in programming computers to understand language so that they will be able to perform such tasks as answering questions and holding a conversation. Well, how big is that? Yeah, it's quite big, and we have similar big things, I think. So, and then it goes on, this is far beyond our current capabilities, so research proceeds by dividing the problems up into manageable subparts. Okay, that's it. You, might, you, you said how you know, programming computers so that they'd be able to perform tasks such as answering questions. How big is that? And I thought, well, I don't know. Let's ask Watson. <laughs> <laughs> but then, oh no, Watson doesn't answer questions. He provides the question for the answer. So it's the more fun to me. You said before that um, uh, when I expressed my being astonished by this relationship between gender and Specific, um, said, okay, we, we had, um, I was astonished years ago, but now I'm not. And, and then you talk about uh, what you're looking at, but actually the things you're looking at, uh, if you the register, the definition of register implies a statistical feature, 
So you correlate right. statistical information with statistics. So okay, that's not. I know. Better. So, so yeah, but just wanted to point out that's not that amazing as having yes, this. Yes, um, I know. Okay. You're absolutely right. Question about this, uh, about the, you could you could consider a corpus being one concept in the data, and you measure the heterogeneity between the uh, corpus. But uh, there is this old saying that says heterogeneity within subgroups is always larger than between subgroups. So that means that within computational linguistics, the heterogeneity of the researchers or mm -hmm. who are in that pool would be larger than the heterogeneity mm -hmm. between the core pie, right? So, so this, the thing is, and I think it's a general problem we have, right, with data models. We define certain things which are supposedly discrete or, or hierarchically dependent, but then we, we, we find out properties between them that we then measure, but uh, we are not really sure if in there the same thing is happening, right? So, classic example, Iraq versus Turkey, you can measure the difference and the similarity, but then you don't talk about curves, which are obviously a big part of the similarity, for example, right? Yeah. So, yeah, is, yeah. is there a way to, you could do the same analysis on author level, for example. Yes, you could. Yeah, you could use this on quite a Your, the slide with the bar graphs showing biology and bioinformatics, um, made me wonder, can you go back to it? Yeah. Um, bioinformatics was, had such an extreme difference from the others yes. that I immediately began wondering, how large is the population of these? <laughs> and is it possible, that, uh, I mean, the population of speakers of these, uh, uh, of these registers, or writers of these registers, mm -hmm. is it possible that just as uh, linguists writing in Massachusetts tend to sound alike because they all sound like one guy. <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if, if it's possible for influential writers to affect the sound of a, uh, of a interdisciplinary field more easily than of a large field. And now I see, I remembered it exactly wrong, it's biology that's the extreme outline. But I'm still interested yeah. uh, in the relative size of the populations. Do you have any sense uh, of that? Point and Michael's point, 
um, um, drive at that, that you know, it, it may well be that he had chosen three other biology journals instead of the three you could get your hands on because they happen to be digitized and freely available or whatever, um, you find different results. Uh, and it also might be the case you find exactly the same results. That, that seems to me to be a really interesting that, you know, how much does the selection model actually influence in our thoughts and, and how we interpret the outcome. Um, and I think DH2 and, and other um, journals or, or sources of data that are less uh, um, uh, uniform in their approach, uh, if they gave us the same results, would give us a, a kind of a taste of, of how much that is in fact. presentations be online somewhere or yes all, everything will be archived the video will be archived we're going to ask all of you so here i'm going to say it once and i'll say it for you many other times um, we're going to ask you for your slides if you're willing to share your lecture notes that would be fantastic if you have them uh, and we could say you know <coughs> share them with the focus of need so that we can get ideas from them or maybe you share them um, more publicly um, and then obviously the white paper will also present kind of a summary of various comments and all of those things yeah. will be linked together. So in the same source as you in the same resource as you as if you need now. Doc, uh, Google probably probably not in no. the in the current WordPress thing, probably in something more permanent and more uh, examination friendly. But the goal is to have the entire thing represented in its various documentary and So it, it is my, my sad lot to always be giving talks, you know, like the last session of the last day, right before lunch, you know, this sort of thing when, when attentions are, are flagging. And I, and I add to that the un, unenviable position of both preceding Michael and following all of you. Uh, so that it's a terrible, because this has been a, a really bracing 
wonderful, enlightening conference for me. And so um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible thing to try to have uh, the second to last word. Should, the, should the, the syntax of XML, this is a really good start for the last session, isn't it? Should the syntax of XML have been scrapped in favor of S expressions? This debate, which raged on for years and which occasionally reappears, ha has all the ring of a, of a religious war. Uh, the sort of Windows versus Emacs, uh, obviously Windows versus Mac, Emacs versus VI, Big Endian versus Little Endian, and so forth. And, and the risks we take in even broaching the subject are manifold. A talk based on a question like this is destined to be both technical and philosophical, which is to say, bad. And, and try as I might, I will undoubtedly seem guilty of favoring one side or another, whatever protestations I make to the contrary. It is in the nature of religious warfare to be on one side or another and to be wrong whichever side you're on. But my purpose here really isn't to settle this question or, or even to reintroduce the debate. What I want to do is use this mostly wrong-headed back and forth to shake out something that I think is actually highly relevant to the topic of data modeling in the humanities or anywhere else. And that, that highly relevant point can be stated pithily by asking, where does the semantics lie in our computational systems? And in fact, what I'd like to say is that this issue subtly affects the way we think about data modeling, even when we try to think about data modeling in complete isolation from any concerns about the use of data models, or even for that matter, computational, uh, computational uh, sorry, when, when we try to think about data modeling in complete isolation from any concern about the use of data models, uh, or even for that matter, computational tractability. But before I launch in on this hopefully meaningful quest for theological insight, <clears throat> perhaps I should explain the terms of the debate that give rise to these meditations. Uh, what to, to start with, uh, what the hell is an S expression? An S expression is a notation for representing tree structures and it, it looks like this. We could define S expressions much more formally using an elegant recursive definition, but this is perhaps besides the main point because anyone looking at this will say, you mean like Lisp? Yes, like Lisp. But let's lay that aside for a moment and just consider the fact that anything we could possibly want to express in this notation can be expressed using the tree structure notation we call XML. Now I'm leaving off attributes here, but it's easy to imagine how we might add them in. If we have something like that, where I've added a, an acronym attribute, then we could do something like this. I don't know if that's the best way. Several methods have been proposed, whereby a tree node can be annotated with a key value pair. But the point is this. These two representations are 100% isomorphic. Anything I can do with one, I can do with the other. So you might suppose that one element of the debate involves syntax, and that is certainly true. Some people have argued quite vociferously, notice I didn't say quite correctly, um, that XML is simply a needlessly verbose form of S expression syntax. The standard reply is that syntax matters, and Paul Prescott is probably the most uh, sort of eloquent uh, defender of XML over S expressions as, as a syntactic matter. The S expression syntax is perhaps less busy. On the other hand, do you really want your TEI document to end with 75 closing parentheses? But that is not actually the center of this debate at all. The center of the debate is the charge that XML has no semantics. Before I delve into what such a thing could possibly mean in this context, let's dive down one additional rabbit hole and ask, what does it mean for something to have a semantics? The most frequently offered answer to that question is that semantics refers to what a particular representation means. Terence Parr, who is the author of the Antler Parser Generator, and therefore someone who presumably should know what semantics is, says this. Loosely speaking, semantic analysis figures out, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, loosely speaking, semantic analysis figures out what the input means. Anything beyond syntax is the semantics. Now, now, this appears in a book called Language Implementation Patterns, 
hardly light reading, but not a textbook on formal languages. He can surely be forgiven for speaking loosely. But when we turn to actual textbooks on formal languages, we get statements like this. This, is a, this book is an analytical study of programming languages. Our goal is to provide a deep, working understanding of the essential concepts of programming languages. Most of the essentials relate to the semantics or meaning of the program elements. Now, uh, I don't want to, that, that is from a formal textbook on, on, on formal language theory. Uh, he obviously doesn't stop there, but, but any one time we say, what is semantics? These books tend to say, well, it's meaning. Now, both of these statements, and I could cite dozens more, seem to me to beg the question, what is meaning? Or to put it more awkwardly, what does it mean for something to mean something? Obviously, this paper can only get worse. <laughs> My favorite denizen of this particular rabbit hole is someone who's come up a couple of times. Um, and that is Ludwig Wittgenstein, who offered what I continue to think is the most provocative answer to, the, to that question ever given. Some of you may be familiar with the canonical quotation in which his basic idea appears. For a large class of cases, though not for all, in which we employ the word meaning, it can be defined thus. The meaning of a word is its use in the language. It, be, can, it can be difficult to see at first what is so radical about this conception. Wittgenstein, uh, Wittgenstein, in fairness, spends a few hundred pages drawing it out. Taken superficially, it might seem to be a statement about context that how a word is used is important. But Wittgenstein goes considerably further than that by rejecting the entire notion that propositions are true or false or otherwise meaningful based on some condition exterior to those propositions. In fact, what he really says is that there isn't anything other than use in context. There isn't anything to speak of beyond this complex web of relations. What is justice? Justice is the set of moments in which the term is deployed. That doesn't make the question itself nonsensical or unanswerable. What is justice, after all, is an instance in which the term is employed. But it does make it unlikely that we'll get very far in forming a useful all-purpose definition. And since forming useful all-purpose definitions is presumably one of the goals of philosophy, we may find that posing questions like this gets us exactly nowhere. What is useful about all of this for my purposes, though, is the fact that this idea of meaning in use gives us not only a way to talk about computational represent, uh, not, uh, give us not only a way to talk about computational representations, but as a, as a way to describe computation itself. Computation, stated in the most minimalistic way possible, is about taking information from one state to another. In the normative case, it is about some linguistic, taking some linguistic construct and, and producing another linguistic construct, though that is not at all essential. If you have a process that can take information and produce more information, we call that process a computation. It's what happens when you press the equal sign on a calculator, and it's what happens when you friend someone on Facebook. The fact that we have some process by which to affect that transformation indicates something in particular about the information with which we began. We say that it has a semantics. And this restates Wittgenstein's point quite succinctly. The information has meaning, has a semantics, because we can produce other states from it, states being anything from reorganizations to physical actions. In the absence of such productions, whether actual or potential, the information is literally meaningless. And while that condition might be rare, it sets a boundary condition on semantics. Most computational representations have a semantics because it is at least possible to imagine computations being performed on them. This is perhaps why Friedman and Wand, from whom I drew that previous quotation about the essentials of programming languages having to do with semantics, go on a few sentences later to say, the most interesting question about a pro program as object but a program as object is, what does it do? If meaning is use, then who can argue? So when the Lispers say that XML has no semantics, they are presumably referring to the fact that by itself, XML has no inherent ability to produce anything at all. You need to describe that semantic meaning somewhere else, which is exactly the same as saying that you need some process by which that representation is either transformed into some other kind of representation or otherwise results in another representation being produced. But is that any less true of S expressions? Isn't an S expression 
also a representation in search of a means by which it can be translated into some other representation? What could, it poss what could possibly cause someone to say that S expressions have a semantics while XML does not? And, and I've read this entire flame war, so you don't have to. <laughs> okay. and the, uh, and the, but the answer to that question, uh, when some, you know, S expressions ha uh, has a semantics while XML does not, uh, at, the answer to that question does have to do with Lisp, because Lisp, in Lisp, there is no inherent difference between the representation you use for data and the representation you use for the process, i.e. code. This, by the way, is called homoiconicity, and it's an inherent property of all languages in the Lisp family. The most striking example uh, of homoiconicity outside the Lisp family is, wait for it, XSLT. In either case, it means that any code you write is also a data structure in the language, and conversely, any data structure you create is at least potentially an executable process. I say potentially because the Lispers are completely and totally wrong when they say that S expressions have a semantics. They have a semantics if and only if you also have a way of taking that representation and using it to produce something else. That is to say, S expressions have a semantics if you also have a Lisp to process them. The consequent notion for XML is that XML has a semantics if and only if you also have a way of taking that representation and using it to produce something else. That is to say, XML has a semantics if you also have a schema combined with some way to process it. But notice the difference there. If you have S expressions, you need a Lisp runtime. If you have XML, you need a schema, which is to say a grammar description combined with a type and structure ontology, what we would call, in this context, a data model, combined with a presumably Turing-complete language. The difference, in other words, has, yes, has less to do with angle brackets and parentheses and much more to do with where the semantics lies in the overall system. It is possible, of course, to process S expressions without Lisp. It would also be possible to separate the grammatical description of type and structure constraints from the entity responsible for affecting the transformation and still be doing Lisp. We are not talking about some kind of new affordance offered by Lisp, some deficiency in the XML ecosystem, or the other way around. When it comes to taking things from one information state to another, either system could be designed either way. So my question is this, does it matter at all where you put the semantics? And the answer to that, I think, is yes, and for more, the same, more, more or less the same reasons that syntax matters. The XML ecosystem implicitly imagines a radical decoupling between the act of data modeling and the act of processing data. In fact, it breaks the act of data modeling itself into several discrete stages, which, in practical terms, translates into a decoupling of the social act of marking up texts from the social act of modeling data and both from the social act of processing data. I use the term social act as a way of designating different potential functions, job descriptions, if you like, in the overall job of computation. You can be the person who decides how a grammar is applied in a particular instance, or you can be the person who defines the grammar, or you can be the person who uses the grammar and the document to translate the information to another state, or obviously you could be all three. What the Lispers argue for is really a world in which the three things are combined. Some partition of roles is, of course, still possible, but in practice, the Lisp ecosystem more or less demands that data modeling and data processing are never far from one another. While it's possible to imagine an S expression tagger, maybe that would be a perenner, it is less easy to imagine that person not also being, at some level, a programmer. But forget about Lisp, again, because the real issue is not whether Lisp is good or bad. The issue is whether the distributed, decoupled model embodied in the XML ecosystem limits or expands our ideas about data modeling as compared to a more centralized workflow in which data modeling is never far from data processing. And here I will risk starting my own flame war by saying that practically speaking, it does. It does because it is not possible to fully describe the semantics of anything apart from the processing that is enabled by the semantic relationships so described. An XML schema, and here I'm talking about any kind of schema at all, uh, describes a grammar. It is, in fact, explicitly based on BNF grammars, which, of course, are used to also describe 
programming languages. This, and not any particular inst instantiation, is the data model, a statement which the designers of XML, by the way, are, are, you know, are in full agreement on. Typically, a schema defines a set of data types and a set of ordering constraints, which again are semantically meaningful only at the point that the document is processed. But why stop there? Why not use that schema to define a set of control structures for processing data? Why not state whether variables are bound late or early, lazily or not? Why not define a set of data structures into which the data may be trivially but predictably transformed? Well, you say they did. It's called XSLT, and it's separate, and it's optional, and that's good. And you might be right. In fact, I think you are. <laughs> but the fact still remains. Every data model is asymptotically approaching a processing model. I would even suggest the that the question, are the data models we have proposed for the humanities sufficient to the task, is equivalent to ask to the question, does the semantics reside in the right place in our model? Not because shifting the semantics around gives you new processing powers, because it does not, but because the degree to, which, to the degree that any data model attempts to stay neutral with respect to future processing regimes, it must limit the practical affordances offered by that model to the data modeler. To do so might be to commit an act of magnanimity. To construct a data model in the absence of any particular judgment about future processing is presumably to let a thousand processes flourish. But it is also to limit what can be modeled because that is exactly where a good number of the decisions about semantics are being made. We may comfort ourselves with the thought that every step up the chain of abstraction allows more flexibility at the processing level, but a dark voice remains and should remain. Every step up the chain of abstraction also means separating further and further from what is presumably the point of all of this, namely the attempt to exploit the computational tractability of the data. To give the processor more power is necessarily to give the data modeler less control. Not just less control over the processing, but less control over the data model itself. So we really must ask ourselves, does having less control over the data model, which is not the same, as sa same thing as saying more flexibility, make sense for our data? Should we have gone this way? Should we have attempted to create a more tightly coupled ecosystem in which the line between data modeling and data processing vanishes as a practical matter, as it does, I would argue, in SQL? Should we now think about doing that? I don't know. And I'm sorry to end with something so obviously decoupled from a practical recommendation of any kind. But I take the point of this symposium to have been, can we do what we want to do? And I think it's at least apposite to point out that as long as we're talking about what we want to do, we are talking at least partially about what our data models cannot do by themselves. So, thank you. I saw Will stand up even before you. Yeah, wait a minute. Great, man. Strategic move there. I thought that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I thought this was very interesting. Loud. Um, that was um, um, a really a critical point was when you identified the relationship between the design of the XML ecosystem and the roles uh, played by different people within those workflows, right? And in fact, I would go further. I would say that actually XML takes a step back towards the list model away from what SGML had had. had in the oh, that's true. Um, yeah, that's good. And, point. And, yeah. And, and and SGML reflects a design that was very deliberately mapped towards those roles because it's designed for a publishing system within which you have authors or content creators who, who create you know, the stuff and mark it up because it needs to push through the system. Yeah. And then you have editors that define the rules. And then you have production specialists who then optimize the processing of the information for the particular output. Right? And so the, the design of that system is actually, you know, this comes out of IBM. You know, other such places, but um, you know, it's very reflective of a certain sort of industrial cultural in information <laughs> production and management strategy, which is appropriate to certain kinds of uh, information also. So, is it archived? I guess it's a well, I think that's a, a and, I, and I really don't make I, I, I really don't make 
need to take a, a strong stance on this. I, right. I really just want to put that. Yeah, I understand. And, but you see, I think that the, the question, is it our kind, is actually vital because one of the reasons why XML has worked so well is because it does take a step back towards the list model. It says that you know you don't have to have your schema up front. You can go ahead and you know manage Absolutely. things sort of with the markup and just the style sheet, and then kind yep. of the schema, and sort of it gives you another sort of way to get into that cycle, so that you yep. don't have to you know do everything up front waterfall style. Right? And that's been really, really tremendously important and useful for us, right? But you see, the thing is that the dark side of the list model is that you can't really do anything unless you're a sort of uh, an auteur who understands everything all at all points, and it doesn't allow you to split things out into... Right, and, and worse than, right, and worse than that, I mean, XML, now there's XSLT, but XML also imagines that, like, uh, you know, when it says no particular processing regime is imagined, I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely doesn't care what language you use or what platform you use or anything like that. You know, the answer to qu the question, how do you do anything in the list model is Lisp. How do I transform documents into other S expression in Lisp? How do I, how do I extract information? Lisp. How do I search the documents? Lisp, right? Uh, you know, is that a, that, no wonder the Lispers like it, uh, but you know, that's a, but I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. You actually do hear that kind of rhetoric out of the XML syntax yeah, also. Yeah. Um, and, you know, which isn't to say that everybody loves XML syntax for everything, but at a certain point, the syntax fades away and turns you know, into the data model itself yeah. and into the, you know, the particular affordances of the, of the, of the tree hybrid. Yeah. Um, and, and so um, the, the, I think the, the point here is that, um, that splitting the things out is actually very, very good because it allows us to to uh, distribute work and to work together and to communicate across boundaries and to optimize our roles and to. Uh, but but would you grant to me that it's 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 suddenly reducing the affordances of the data modeler as the person absolutely it's a compromise. There's a trade-off. There's a trade-off, but that that, tra that trade-off frightens me a little bit because, especially in the context of a symposium like this, where we want to take that work. Well, what it, does, what it does is it puts, it puts you in a position where you can do those things, but only if you can affect communications within a larger team. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. Right? And, 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 and that, you know, which is a good yeah. thing, too. Right? Yeah. So we should have invited the programmers to this. <laughs> Next. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, first, um, I, I'm thanking you for uh, providing such a nostalgic uh, brief just before leaving tonight and having to spend an awful night because I will think again about Lisp and Prologue like we had this discussion yesterday. I was an old fan of, and I just have seen Lisp fade away. That's <laughs> 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 so it, It's really, you know, uh, you should have avoided that. <laughs> Anyhow, I mean, I, I took two major things which are essential for our discussion here concerning data modeling. I would put that on the horizontal and vertical line. First thing, horizontal, when you speak about isomorphy, it, this is essential that when we are reflecting upon ourselves, when we model something, that we can take this, this stance of saying, look, whatever tool we have, and we can just draw things on a paper, like draw a tree if we really like trees. The isomorphism is essential, and it is reflected in, in yeah, orientations like taken at the OMG with the notion of meta models or what we're doing also in this uh, ISO Committee on Language Resources where we describe mechanisms by which through meta models and decorations with data categories we actually create classes of models which in turn can be instantiated in any kind of XML vocabulary or uh, whatever right. syntax from the past we don't want to mention. <laughs> the, um, the second aspect you, you pronounce the word affordance, and I think you went, because it's the, the purpose of the talk at the end of, the, of three days like this, you went very far saying, basically, you cannot think of any kind of modeling without thinking about processing. When you take some distance a little bit, this notion of affordance says, okay, when you start modeling data, is to contemplate a certain s series of processing that you would like to do. As a researcher, you would like to search the data, you would like to be able to have through those affordances, the capacity to link and create new concepts which are on the, more on the research uh, 
side than just the observation side. So those affordances are very central also when, when modeling things. What are the concepts on which I want to create a certain stability in my data? So it's not just one single-sided orientation for one type of processing. It's really a, a yeah, like we so so a would, statistical method. Although I would point out to you that the, the, the TI guidelines disagree with you on the fourth line on that. Right, I mean, they disagree with you very quickly on the idea that what you do to begin the data modeling process is think about the processing regimes you want to enable. That's, 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 that's the way you're not supposed to do it in the XML ecosystem. I, I mean, you know, I mean, like, like that's, a, that's, a, that's, I mean, you may think that's crazy, and so do I, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The but, is but, a marketplace to create possible affordances. Right, although it's interesting because what you just said is slightly different from the argument Julia was making yesterday or today, so it's all blend together. That, that if we look at the odd files, what we will see is change. Like if we can arrange odd files and analyze them, what, what we'll see is the scholarly community having a changing conception about text. And I, and I, I you know, I think the way I would say that, and I think maybe the way Laurent would say that as well, is that, is that actually what we're seeing is, is changing process requirements over time. Mm -hmm. And that is where the changing conceptions of text are occurring, right? It's not like we do the odd, we look at, you know, we change around the odd files because our notion of text is changing. That's too direct, right? Really what's happening is, is we want to do new things mm -hmm. and we keep adjusting the odd. And again, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, and I think this is really what I'm trying to talk about. Is like where, I mean, where do we put the line between, where is it our job and somebody else's job to think? I mean, you know, it, because I, I mean, I agree with you fundamentally, but, it, but I also think that we are, when we talk about data modeling, we, we, we are implicitly drawing a line, we're, we're locating a point on the slope that, that, <laughs> at which modeling approaches processing. And I, you know, and, and so I, I, and that was really all I'm trying to draw in this paper is, do we have that line right? And we may, and I, and I, you know, I mean, as a practical matter, we may. Well, maybe, I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, um, uh, I would also point out that, that you know, XSLT uh, is, is uh, bears it, it, in a tremendous family resemblance to scheme. And I think on purpose, because I think they were thinking about this exact issue when they wrote it. I think they were, I think they were, they were, <laughs> this was the, it, this was one of the issues they were thinking about. Which of course the Perl programmers never no. thought. Thank you. Sorry. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Steve. This is absolutely fantastic. And I, I, mean, I ate it up and I'm going to probably eat it up again. <laughs> but, um, but I, you're very kind. I, I want you to, I want to hold the position of, I was going to say the devil's advocate, but yeah. I think perhaps after what you said to Lauren, I'm playing the TEI advocate. Yeah, yeah, no, devil In again. saying that um, I, I, I'm a fan of believing we can decouple our semantics from our processing. I'm a, and, and that comes from my, from my personal history. Uh, as many in the room know, I worked with Women Writers Project generating these texts, building not necessarily good models back then, but models of these texts yeah. without any possibility of processing, without any hope of processing yeah. for years to come in a complete vacuum of a processing environment. Vaporware was my best friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had to develop the semantics without any processing. I, I, and I think that we can still usefully build models that represent our thoughts about a text and and defer the, the processing either to later in time or to someone else down the road at some other place in our institution in a very useful way. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's well, well, no, I, mean, you, you, you're, I mean, can we? Well, we have. I mean, yeah. we, you know, it's, I mean, it's not like the can we? I mean, we're sure. I mean, we, we did, yeah. you know, but did we do it? I mean, because let, let's like do as a thought experiment, and I was talking about this, this was Wendell, like let's imagine liminal. What, one of the things that's exciting, we'll go back to the very first talk. What's exciting about liminal to me, um, I mean, there's practical reasons why you might want to model things and allow overlapping hierarchies and, and have them in the same thing. But one of the, 
the excitement's about liminal to me is it, it I, I see it as a kind of like, you know, sort of um, anarchic experimental playground for reimagining data modeling. Because we, we could, in a moment of perversion, we could say, you know what, this language is going to have no nouns in it. There's going to be no such thing as italics. That's not going to be, there's only going to be italicize. Everything is going to be a program, a processing instruction, right? That would be a very, like, radical view of, yeah, well, you could. With, with are you thinking of things like Coco and event-based? Uh, uh, maybe not, because they, because they could be. Yeah, T-Roth, right, right, T-Roth, and yes, absolutely. But, but with the liminal syntax, uh, you could have, like, it's possible, and I'm thinking on my feet here, but it's possible that the overlapping hierarchy, like, if you think of those as functions and not as ontic boundaries or objects or something like that, then it's possible that the problem of overlapping hierarchies disappears in part because you can always run functions in parallel. You can always you can run as many as you want. You can say this event started and this event ended as opposed to saying this is a discrete, I don't know, I have not sat down and, and figured that out. But, but, but my point is just this, that I don't, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't dispute that, that first of all, we have done it, as, you know, and, and second of all, we may have done it for all the right reasons and have the best possible system. On the other hand, as long as we're here to talk about data modeling, I really do want to think about other worlds and whether those worlds might have given us a different view. Because I presume one of the symposium arose in part with a kind of anxiety. You know, do, do we have it right? Do we have the right tools? Do we have the right thoughts? Do we have the right affordances? You know, I mean, I, it seems to me that's a way to ask the question is, well, maybe it's all wrong. Maybe the list guys were right. I mean, the list guys were not right, obviously. You know, but, but maybe they were. Maybe they had something to say. I think you raised exactly the right point, right? It's, like, it's not only in the 1990s you could only model what you thought about the text, but it's like in the human history you could only yeah. model uh, what you thought about the world, right? And right now you can actually start processing. It's the interesting thing that we, we, we have applied the models and we have collected the data, now we can actually process and, and actually take a look at if, if it makes sense or not, right? We can, we can look at this text and you can say, is Sid's model better than the model of the Zodiac, for example, right? And that's, that's, that's a, a huge shift also, that's, that's the race of data scientists and versus data models. Right? And, and, and what better means in that context is also going to be contested. Yes. Um, and, and I mean, what I would say is, in the good old days back in the 90s, we, we didn't actually have semantics. But we had claims about semantics, right? We had, in, in the sense that, in the, in the strict computation, in, in the sense that, that, that Steve is, is talking yes. about. And, and um, we were, we were uh, declaring a semantics, and we were making semantic commitments, uh, because our data was like this, which meant it was not like that. Um, but, uh, and, and therefore, you could certainly say there's a semantic potential in that. And in fact, I think that one of the fascinating things about, uh, about descriptive markup regimes in general, and Trevor was talking about this yesterday, is the way in which we, we, we actually do try to, um, uh, to uh, maintain a kind of discipline of non-commitment to particular operations in favor of, you know, it's much like Fotis is just talking about with respect to the scholar talking about uh, about, about the Enlightenment, um, you know, there's a climate, which means that you decide what we mean by climate. Um, and that, in, in, in fact, um, you, know, I, 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 you know, I want to see what you're going to be doing with the liminal, but I also think that Sid is going to be able to use it to write, um, to, to describe data structures, which he has no idea about how to process. Well, we're, and we're, will not battle for it. Poor Michael is over there thinking I'm going to reinvent Roth. But actually, I have a grander plan. What I'm going to create is the TTI. It's the Text Transformation Initiative. And it imagines that, it imagines, I mean, I mean, it's possible. Like, you could say, you could say, we're not going to define objects in a, in a 3,000 tag set. We're going to, we're going to have user contribute, we're going to, we're going to describe oper functions and operations. I mean, I, I mean, I'm pretty convinced that's, that's insane. But I, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's fun, as Alan pointed out.
not quite true. And it's, it's a little disingenuous, but it's, it's very importantly so, because in fact, we had what you might call an intermediary processing model. That is to say, we knew that we knew what kind of people were going to want to do what kind of thinking well, with our text. We didn't know what kind of specific tools they used to do those things, but we knew that they want to study people, and we knew that they want to study genre, and we knew that they want to study these things at all. I wonder if we, if, well, if it's just a question of identifying processing at the right level of specificity. You had the, the dream of the processing efforts. Right, but you, but you also had the ability, and you did not fail to take advantage of the opportunity to validate against a scheme. Sure, uh, sure. Just, but, just, that's what. Dirty, After don't don't tell them. Point, yes. <laughs> <laughs> just, 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 just for the sake of constant, I mean, we're talking about isomorphism. It's like isomorphism all the way down, right? I mean, it, it's sort of when we are, we are, we are explicitly not talking about our ability to go from one input to another output. We're not talking. We're not talking about can you do it or can you? You know, we're we're talking about a kind of like, have we separated the concerns right? Have we put people's mental energy in the right place? I mean, th I mean, these questions seem to me paramount, and they are, and they're connected to our architectures and our models. And it comes back. You know, I did say on the beginning, it is. We, you know, I want an answer to the question, why is the, our workflow look so unlike some of the other workflows that are used? In, I mean, it was very interesting, uh, Elka, you know, <laughs> she said, put up her data model, it, uh, Weka, R, Rapid Miner. I mean, the, I mean, that's a very different way of thinking about data modeling and, and not an illegitimate way of thinking about data modeling. I mean, we're, we're sort of different, maybe for good reasons, but what else? I want to say real quickly before you move to the next section, I think Wendell's pointing at the term potential semantics. Using semantics as potential that's a real powerful concept. Yeah, potential semantics. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you all. So I propose we take eight minutes, <laughs> scuttle off to the bathroom, to the snacks, et cetera, grab the snacks, come back, and then let's let Michael lead the final, uh, final sort of summing up. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Good.